And without any further ado, I will give the floor to the Super Coordinator, Maria Costello. Thank you very much, uh, Vasia. Uh, yes, I am Maria Bustela from the Complutense University of uh, Madrid and Supera Coordinator. And I would like very much to welcome you all to our seminar, Mutual uh, Learning and Exchange Between Research Funding Organizations to Foster Inter Institutional Change on behalf of the Supera uh, Consortium. I would also like very much to uh, welcome and thank you uh, our sister projects Gender Smart and Caliper and especially to our speakers today Lawrence uh, Guillard, Donia Lassinger, Nadine Dricot and Elena Simeon. Thank you very much for being here uh, with us. Um, in Super App, we, we uh, uh, really also, sorry, I would also like to, to thank uh, Yellow Window for preparing this uh, RFO uh, seminars and webinar series uh, from which this seminar is, is the last one. Uh, we, we end uh, Super App now in, in May uh, after uh, four uh, years. And, uh, and also to uh, the Spanish ministry, Nisin, uh, for being uh, behind the scenes of all these uh, RFOs uh, webinars. Um, in Supra, we have always um, thought from the very first moment of the proposal uh, about how important it is that research funding organizations uh, play a key role uh, in structural change. Um, apart from the institu institutional changes needed in the research uh, performing organizations such as universities and research uh, centers, uh, the institutions uh, giving and distributing uh, the money for research are absolutely key to make those uh, change uh, possible. How research uh, proposals are called upon and evaluated uh, and, and funded, it is extremely important uh, for uh, this uh, structural uh, change. Um, during these five years, four, four years of, uh, 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 of, of project and the first year for the proposal, we have seen uh, a, a significant development on, on, uh, in uh, research, uh, in research funding organizations and their involvement in a structural change uh, programs. Um, of course, this, uh, this has allowed us, for example, to uh, focus uh, within the super app uh, project, for example, in trying to develop and, and, and go around to the regional RFOs, uh, for example, in Spain, that's the case, uh, that were not so much developed as the, at the national uh, level. And of course, this has allowed uh, us to, um, to, to really take advantage of this mutual exchange and, and, and learning. Um, that is something that it's a, really a kind of a principle uh, in Supera that we have, uh, we, we really have wanted to uh, develop uh, as one of our principles is the uh, cum cumulativeness so this is this idea of not reinventing the wheel, but really taking advantage of all what we are working together and learning uh, together. So thank you very much uh, again on behalf of the Supera Consortium and uh, let's uh, start uh, the webinar. Thank you uh, very much. And I think now the floor is for uh, Lydia Gonzalez from FESIT and Missin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay. Good morning to all the speakers and attendees of this uh, webinar. My name is Lydia Gonzalez, and I'm part of the of the team uh, led by the Women and Science Unit of the Spanish Ministry of Science and Innovation that is in charge of the gender equality actions in research funding organizations in the framework of this project. Our aim was to guide and support the development of gender equality plans in two RFOs, one state RFO from Spain and one regional RFO from Italy. 
one of the support structures for this uh, objective was to establish a dedicated RFO network and thus um, tailored to RFO's needs. Although we wanted to work together with uh, research performing or organizations and learn, uh, of course, from their longer experience uh, with gender equality plans, there are specific fields of action, targets, and measures that need to be tailored to the specific activities and areas of action of research funding organizations. This objective resulted in two main activities. Um, first, the development of pilot networks of regional RFOs, for instance, in Spain, as Maria has mentioned. And second, this series of uh, webinars specifically for research funding organizations. Previous webinars uh, since November 2020 have focused on the ex exchange of experiences in research funding organizations, how can RFOs fight gender bias, gender equality in funding mechanisms, and unconscious bias, and what RFOs can do. For these webinars, we have joined national and regional funding organizations from Austria, Czech Republic, France, Italy, Netherlands, and Spain. More information can be accessed uh, on these webinars through the project website. For this webinar, um, one of the last uh, webinars before the end of the project, if not uh, the last one, our supporting partners have invited both less and more experienced research funding organizations. Far from being a transfer of knowledge from the more to the, to the less experienced, we are convinced that knowledge on gender equality plans in some, is something that is co-created by all of us and needs to consider the different contexts, resources, resistances, and structures, among other factors in the different institutions. The aim of SUPERA with these activities has been to collect experiences and resources for research funding organizations in order to help them improve their impact on gender equality in the field of research and innovation by reviewing and addressing from a gender perspective their funding priorities, the management of research calls, the scientific evaluation, and the monitoring of funding projects, uh, among others, that can be consider or be part of their gender equality policies or, or gender equality plans. This has an added incentive, if I may use this uh, expression, now that RFOs are also expected to fulfill the eligibility criterion regarding gender equality plans for beneficiaries of Horizon Europe uh, with its mandatory process uh, requirements. European funded projects related to gender and science, as we call them sister projects, have had an important role highlighting the need to involve research funding organizations to achieve the main objectives of the Commission regarding gender equality in research and innovation, both the ones related to research career and decision making related to uh, gender balance and presence of women, and the one on the integration of the gender dimension in the content of research and innovation. We like to think that SUPRA is part of that history as uh, involved in the gender and science community in Europe. So to conclude, on behalf of the Women and Science Unit, I hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar and I'm sure we, all, uh, we will all benefit from it. And now I'll give the floor to Vasya Madesi. Thank you very much, Lydia. I will also uh, share quickly my uh, screen. Um, and uh, before we start uh, with, uh, with the webinar today, I would like to explain a little bit about uh, the agenda. Uh, it will have two main parts. So uh, first, the four uh, RFOs will present their journey and what they are up to now in their organization. And then we will have the facilitated uh, Q&A session between the RFOs where they will have the chance to ask each other questions about specific topics that they are of interest. And then we will have enough time for you to pose also your questions. 
But before we start with the presentation of the research funding organizations, I would like to briefly introduce you uh, the speakers of uh, today. Starting with uh, Laurence, who is also representing a Gender Smart Project, who has a PhD in sociology. Her main research has focused on gender issues in health at, uh, at work on social mobility. She works at ANR since 2011, and she's head of the relationship with the scientific communities, Gender Equality Scientific Integrity Delegate. She's a member of the National Committee for Monitoring Equality Action Plans and represents the agency at Science Europe for the Research Culture Axis. Then we have uh, Donia Lasinger, who is the Deputy Managing Director of the Vienna Science and Technology Funds. In addition to funding activities, she is involved in studies, evaluations, and consulting activities at WWTF and manages various projects, including the EU-funded GECO and CoChange projects in the field of gender mainstreaming and further RRI topics like open innovation. She studied business sciences in Austria and Ireland and specialized in strategy and innovation management. During and after her doctoral studies, she worked as strategy and management consultant on a national and international level. Her main competencies include expertise in innovation, management, strategic development, and research and innovation. Then we also have with us uh, Nader uh, Rico, after uh, studying political sciences, uh, she obtained a master's degree on public policies in Europe. Since 2018, she has been working in FRS uh, or FNRS, the research funding agency for the French speaking universities of Belgium, first in the national department, mainly as a national contact point for FP7. In 2017, uh, she was appointed contact person for gender while keeping her NCP functions. Since the beginning of Horizon Europe, she uh, is uh, only NCP for MSCA, which helps uh, save time for coordinating the work towards the first gender equality plan of FNRS, and she will explain more, of course, later. And finally, we have uh, with us Elena, who is uh, representing also the Caliper project and has a master's degree in international business management and an MBA in technology management. For the past 10 years, she has been working as a development and implementation expert in international projects. Her experience covers initiatives funded under Horizon 2020, FP7, Interreg Europe, uh, Danube Transnational Programme, and ERANET. And she's also uh, a member of the Joint Programming Initiative Urban Europe Management Board. Elena is part of a development team that works in the design of policy recommendations to boost the R&I community in Romania and recently concentrating efforts on bringing into the national focus the gender equality dimension in research and innovation. And after all this uh, important information about our speakers, without uh, any uh, further ado, I will give the floor uh, first to Laurence, who will present us the journey of ANR. So Laurence, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vasya. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Okay, so let me, uh, let me introduce uh, the, the ANR <laughs> and uh, the organization of Okay, uh, so ANR is the main uh, national research funding agency in France, and uh, it is placed under the supervision of the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation. And that ministry allocates an annual budget dedicated to funding research projects, which is a little bit more than a billion. Um, the agency employs a little bit more than 300 people and the vast majority of whom has a scientific background. So what are the missions of the, of the agency? Well, the, 
missions has been defined in a decree in August 2006 and uh, amended on March 2014. And the first and main mission is to fund and promote basic and targeted research, technical innovation, and technology transfer, as well as partnership between private and public domain. Second mission is to implement the program approved by the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation, because the agency doesn't make its own program on herself. Uh, we also have to manage stake uh, undertaken great investment programs in teaching and research fields. Uh, we have to threaten scientific partnerships on European and international levels and uh, to an analyze, oh, analyze the evolution of research opportunities and measuring the agency funding impact on the national scientific production. So we have uh, each year an annual program and for uh, 2022, the different calls uh, for proposals inscribed uh, in, in the program is uh, the generic call for proposals, which is the, the main and biggest one that we launch every year uh, since uh, 2014. And uh, to give you an idea of the volume of pre-proposals, we receive around 8,000 pre-proposals each year. Um, this goal includes five funding instruments dedicated to uh, individual projects or collaborative uh, research project projects. Uh, we have 56 scientific evaluation committees uh, for this uh, call, and it is a two-stage selection process. And we have also specific call, what we call specific calls for proposals at European or international level. Some are focused on public-private uh, partnerships, and we also launch uh, calls depending on the uh, political or environmental context um, calls. Uh, and for example, we launched uh, a, a, a call on COVID, on Fukushima, Saga, on IT, etc. So we also uh, have uh, we we have elaborated um, a gender equality plan. Uh, that was approved in December 2019 and presented to the administrators board in July 2020. The plan includes three main axes. <clears throat> the first one uh, <clears throat> deals with uh, culture and organization. The second one is on uh, human resources and the third one on evaluation and selection process. And we have inscribed uh, uh, 65 uh, actions uh, for a four year period to 2020 to 2023. Um, few words on the gender or sex dimension in research uh, content. Uh, we had a two-year test phase on the generic call for proposals, uh, 20, uh, two, uh, 2020 and 2021. And this phase uh, consisted on, on uh, asking the candidates uh, how uh, they were uh, considering or taking into account the sex or uh, gender dimension in the project, in the research that they were proposed. Uh, and if not, uh, they had to explain why uh, they didn't uh, uh, took uh, this uh, dimension into account. Um, this uh, was to, uh, they had to, to uh, fulfill a, 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 a template on the online, on the uh, submission platform, and the evaluators did not have access 
uh, to uh, the content of, of uh, that part. Because the uh, objective was to assess the, lev the level of awareness and understanding on the gender issues in research content. And uh, it was also, um, the, the objective was also to raise awareness among researchers and to gradually include this dimension among the evaluation criteria. And uh, it is now applied for 2022. Uh, the dimension, sex and gender dimension is one of the evaluation criteria. So this is it for my presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Laurence. So uh, in case there are any questions, uh, we remind you again that you can post them on the chat and uh, we can continue with the presentation of uh, Donia. Thank you very much. I will give you a brief introduction of my organization and what we are, as we are quite different from the one that you've heard before, as we're a regional and private uh, player. And just to quickly give you um, a hint or an idea of what we're doing and what our um, way or our, 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 our road or our uh, travel was towards uh, gender equality. So as I just mentioned, we are quite different. Uh, we are a regional funding agency, so we are concentrating only on, on Vienna and uh, not Austria in a whole. So if you compare us with the national funding organizations, we are a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit also comparing the funding uh, portfolio they have or even the, the money they have that they can spend. But I guess that we nevertheless, we're quite important for the Viennese context in setting priorities and allocating resources, as I said, money, and uh, we're a niche player. So we um, take certain goals that we want to, to, um, uh, to operate in. Um, our mission is um, are kind of a little bit similar um, uh, like you heard before. So our main goal is the support of excellent scientific research in Vienna. We concentrate on basic research and as a niche player, we really have very specific topics, for example, life sciences or information communication technology. Um, and we only operate in these thematic priorities. We have four at the moment, which are very long lasting and we stick to them for quite a while to have an, an impact in the field where we're operating. We do this via competitive calls. So we, we don't have open calls that run the whole time. We have very uh, dedicated uh, calls and call sets. Uh, they run normally for a year and we have around three to four calls per year. So just to get an idea how big uh, we are. We fund projects on the one side, so meaning that we fund people and scientists who are already in Vienna, but we also bring in new, um, especially very young um, experts and scientists, and we do this via a very specific um, uh, call scheme, which is called the Vienna Research Group's call. Um, just also to give you an, an idea of the, the money we spend, we have around 10 to 50 million euros uh, for each year for funding of uh, science in Vienna. And since uh, 2002, when we start operating, so we have our 20th year anniversary this year, which is quite, uh, quite nice, we spent over 200 million euros. And most of the money is actually coming from the private banking foundation, which means that we also have private fund um, and not a national player which makes it sometimes easier uh, for us as we have flexibility. But on the other hand, we are not bound to any rules or laws or regulations. So we can decide most of the time uh, where we want to go and what we want to do. It's not that easy, but I just want to make a little bit of a difference here. Uh, this region, regional aspect, I think, is very nice as we are, as I said, flexible. But on the other hand, it's also small, so we're restrained with the resources. Just to give you a hint, we are 10 people now working here and um, uh, doing and operating on the, on the funding schemes. Um, so I would summarize it in a nutshell. I would say we are a local or regional actor, but embedded in a very lively context, meaning that we're in, in lively contact with all the research institutions here in Vienna, 
but also in the rest of Austria. And definitely we are also linked with the international scene as all our evaluation procedures are international. So it's only international jury members and reviewers looking at the proposals that are handed in here in Vienna. Uh, we also have contacts with government institutions, other funding bodies, and this is a very lively exchange. Um, just um, uh, to let you know, we're the only um, organization of our kind here in Vienna, so the only large Austrian private non-profit organization here to promote science and research. Um, let me just give you a quick hint what we did and uh, what we did in the field of uh, gender equality. So when we started, uh, we started from very individual measures in place. I mean, there was always a kind of an, a dialogue in our boards. We have an advisory board with 26 members. We have a board of directors with six members. There was always a kind of an, a dialogue that was sometimes more awareness of the problems that we have or where we should be, uh, sometimes it was less. So it was always, you know, a little bit um, and, and, and not a very structured process. And then we had the opportunity, uh, like now five years back, to be part of an EU funded project, the Chico project, which was already mentioned before, um, and really had dedicated resources to look at all our structures, all of our procedures, all of our knowledge that we have in the organization, and to start with a structural and cultural change in the field of gender mainstreaming and gender equality, which was very important for us. As for example, we did dedicated trainings for all employees, but also looking at all our mechanisms that we have in place. Uh, we have no uh, gender equality strategy uh, still not, but I'm coming to that. So it was really nice to look at all our funding cycle work, at the post-call work, the pre-call work, but also the call execution and what we could um, improve there. And I think we did quite a lot in this four-year project. Uh, where we are now, this is uh, maybe the, the important part also for today. We took all everything that we learned. Um, what was very, or um, um, uh, what came to, to my mind is that we concentrated a lot on the outer context, meaning at, uh, the people who get the funds from our side, our applicants, our um, funded people. But we didn't look a very deep look inside, meaning into the organization. Then this is why it's very important now that we that we are in the process of really getting a gender strategy in place, this document that is also necessary for Horizon Europe, as you mentioned before, but also to have the resources dedicated um, to, to uh, proceed with, with uh, gender uh, mainstreaming activities. And what we see at the, the right hand is actually where we now, where we also include action and initiatives to get this strategy into place. And this is what we are discussing at the moment, and we're qu quite far ahead of with that to really get um, everything um, uh, everything ready, uh, meaning that we uh, decided to look at these three uh, topics that you see about decision making processes, data, numbers and knowledge and communication, but also always looking, and this is what these two circles mean, always looking at the outside, meaning jury members, reviewers, applicants, funded people, but also looking in-house, like meaning our boards, um, our employees, and looking where we can improve the situation there. And with that, I'm looking forward actually to the discussion that we will have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donia, for your comprehensive presentation and for actually uh, spotting what the differences were with the ANR. So we will move now to Nadej. Nadej, yes. Okay, we can see your screen. Great. Hi. Good morning, sorry. Um, yes, thank you, Vasya. Nadej is a perfect pronunciation. <laughs> so you did well on that, you progressed. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk now about the FNRS journey towards a gender equality plan. 
So first, few words about FNOS. So with a research funding agency uh, for the French speaking community of Belgium. Uh, so just a very brief presentation, so, because I, I'm sure you're all aware that Belgium is quite a small country. Uh, and it's a federal uh, country, so it's divided between the federal level, free regions and free communities. And I think this is the uh, specific uh, of the dimension of Belgium, because they all have a scientific hat. So it's uh, to, to make it easier. <laughs> uh, and about the French speaking community, it covers uh, geographically um, the Wallonia region and the Brussels region, but Brussels regions uh, also uh, contains the Flemish community. Um, and then uh, to say a few more words about the French speaking community. So we have a population of 4.5 million, six research based universities, which covers both basic and applied research, and our funding agency, which covers all scientific domains and funds projects, but also employ scientists, which means that we found uh, fellowships, but we also employ uh, permanent scientists. And uh, below you can see the name of the six universities. Uh, now to be more concrete about our gender equality plan process, uh, we started almost from scratch and uh, we built a transversal working group uh, in order to draft the gender equality plan. Uh, at the beginning, uh, there were three persons which, who were already involved in gender issues. So myself, uh, because I'm the contact point for gender in FNRS, and the two members of the Science and Women Committee created by uh, the French-speaking community ministry which gives us uh, French-speaking universities and FNRS. And for the other members, we try to have at least one representative of the direction out of four directors, one representative of public affairs department, one of our uh, main uh, department for projects, fellowships, and permanent researchers and free representative of our FNRS permanent scientists. And among these three uh, scientists, we try to have a balance between the three comprehensive universities and the three uh, big scientific domains. And also we try to keep it manageable, which means that the working group is made of nine persons. And of course, all of them are busy. And we uh, benefited from the support of a consultancy as, as it was the first time we had to do this exercise. Um, so we started working about the gender equality plan uh, last October uh, via monthly working group meetings with follow-up meetings from December with critic to the member of the FNRS administration. Uh, which means that each time we had a uh, full working group meeting, then we had a restricted meeting uh, in order to, uh, to uh, deepen what was decided inside the working group meeting. Uh, we started by a training on gender equality and gender equality plan because most of the persons among the working group uh, were not trained about uh, this question. And then we had a collective yeah. work via yeah. the MiroPath platform based on existing data to identify the objectives and action for each area, both at the mandatory and recommended uh, level. Uh, also to identify the indicators, the calendar, the departments and functions involved in the implementation of each action. Um, I also had bilateral meetings with the Secretary General. 
And then uh, the first version of the gender equality plan uh, was uh, taken to the bureau of the board of directors uh, and they gave their advice. And uh, after this advice, we updated the gender equality plan. And hopefully uh, this last and complete version will be validated by the board of directors next week. Now regarding the challenges and strengths um, about the legal framework, uh, it does not allow for substantial changes in the composition of the boards of directors. And I put plural to boards because uh, our situation is quite complex as we have eight specialized funds with specific rules coming from different sources such as the decision of the uh, board of directors, uh, decree, decrees, framework conventions, etc. We had the problem of time constraints uh, because uh, of the eligibility criterion in Horizon Europe uh, from the deadline from, from the calls with deadlines in 2022. We have the time constraints uh, because of the calendar of the board of trustees meetings, because they only meet every two months. Uh, also, we had to take uh, into account the agenda uh, of the secretary general, which is quite busy, and the agenda of the whole uh, working group, of the members of the working group. And of course, uh, each member of the working group has their usual task to perform besides working on the gender equality plan. Um, also, I would say one of the challenges was the teamwork, which was not uh, easy and which took a lot of time, but it was very instructive, of course. Um, and we could benefit from the complementarities in terms of knowledge and competencies. And I was lucky enough to have a very good level of motivation and involvement from uh, all the persons uh, who were part of the working group. Now about the next steps, uh, my uh, open question would be how to ensure a smooth implementation of the gender equality plan and what about its sustainability? And here I finish, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Nadez, and also for posing the last uh, questions for what is coming up. So last but not least, we have uh, Elena. Yes, uh, is it full screen? Yes, we can see it, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, workshop. I think it's really, really useful for us. We are a research and innovation funding agency at national level in Romania, and we cover also the higher education sector. So we do have a large range of funding instruments available, also taking care of the international cooperation in research and innovation uh, for, for Romania. Um, so we are a pretty uh, large funding agency. Um, in terms of getting closer to the gender equality in research and innovation, we started this journey in 2020 uh, in the framework of the Horizon 2020 project Caliper, and we were lucky enough to get uh, the methodology and the advice to start properly in a rather in favorable uh, environment, we would say. Um, sorry. Our process started with an internal analysis to discover areas for improvement. And after discussing internally with our colleagues around 80 to 90 persons, we discovered some solutions that uh, were tested, discussed, validated, let's say, in, in uh, a sort of external format. We engaged the stakeholders that were knowledgeable at national level to give us feedback on what we were envisaging as solutions for, for this first uh, process in our organization. 
uh, and also looked for some good practices both uh, in the country and uh, in the private sector and outside the country in other funding agencies and of course in the Calipe Consortium. Um, we are on, on this very, very uh, first stages of our process had the first uh, version of our gender equality plan uh, that was immediately uh, taken on board the process itself, the first version by the top management. And that was, I think, one of the best factor for our, for our process in the organization, because we decided that together with the top management, this is, this is a good change that will, will actually uh, be reflected in the values of our organization and we can um, influence also the outside world that is the research and innovation uh, community formed around our funding agency. Um, the internal and external analysis wasn't easy to do. It took almost one uh, a year in our case and if in case of the internal uh, results, we discover that we don't have representation problems in terms that um, the female uh, part was uh, more than the, the, the male part in terms of numbers and also representation in, in terms of management levels. Uh, we discovered that we have no formal protocols regarding this gender equality uh, dimension. And moreover, we discovered that the gender uh, dimension is not sufficiently addressed in research funding. Even if we have some criteria um, and also we learned from uh, international cooperation to consider gender in the research content, we still aren't very, very good at that. And uh, in our discussions, we, we decided it's good to try to position ourselves as the first organization implementing a gender equality plan in Romania and to act as a role model for similar uh, or for the research and innovation uh, actors in Romania. And um, the way we did it, um, the way we designed our first public gender equality plan was by proposing a set of uh, soft measures because structural problems weren't exactly internally noticed. And we have a, a, a lot of information kits foreseen, for an example, for the recruitment process, for communication, for sexual harassment. And we have foreseen a series of trainings for leadership for female uh, employees and the trainings for the, the evaluators um, that will uh, participate in future evaluation committees for our funding instruments. And of course, uh, a set of analysis that we are doing uh, during the implementation that can um, come out with policy recommendations for the ministries around us. Um, concretely, <clears throat> sorry, our gender equality plan has uh, six, let's say, main areas of, of interest. We are looking at the human resources in terms of uh, information kits for the selection process uh, and for um, uh, balancing uh, or reconciling work conditions with uh, life um, balance and uh, career progress, of course. Uh, in terms of institutional governance, we are planning. We haven't uh, done it yet, but we want to have a gender equality body with internal and external participants um, to supervise the implementation of our JEP. Uh, at um, communicational level, of course, we need a communication kit. We have the internal one ready and we are working on the external one, but that's uh, something that needs to take into account the cultural background we are operating in, in our uh, region of Europe. So that uh, will take a bit more time to learn from others how to deal with that. On the moral and sexual harassment in our case, uh, in we, we actually try to raise awareness and to uh, establish a process. So we start from scratch here in, in our case. Uh, in research funding, as already said, we want to um, inform 
correctly the evaluators how to deal with gender in the funding uh, programs we are running. And on the broader innovation ecosystem, because we are really active in our um, country, uh, in, in this, uh, both in research and innovation, meaning also the, the business side um, of it, uh, we do the simple things, trying to um, act as a model in the sense that we try to respect as much as possible the gender quotas, and it's um, communicated as such. Um, maybe uh, that's something challenges during this process, the challenges we had and we are still facing actually, is this resistance to change. I'm sure it's not new, but this is collected not necessarily from the internal experience, but also from the external uh, dialogue with people that help us uh, build the gender equality plan and with those that are trying to follow our model. And uh, it is the resistance to positive measures that's mainly uh, everywhere in the organizations. We talked to uh, the tendency to minimize the imbalances. And of course, we are operating in a legal framework that doesn't allow very easily the changes uh, in public institutions. And not our case, but uh, something that our uh, community has noticed is the, the low degree of stakeholders uh, involvement in, in this process. Um, what I did to actually face these challenges as much as possible, we have a dedicated section on our website that's public, where we present both in English and in Romanian all the methodology, all the process, all the steps we've done so far, and we update it in real time once we make um, a change and a progress in the implementation of our gender equality plan. And that's not a small thing because we have a huge community, um, like for an example, for the newsletter, it's more than 25,000. The community of innovators that's called BrainMap, we have like oh, around 50,000 people there. So we we do have a lot of, of influence on, or we can uh, act as a role model for, for a lot of organizations here in Romania. And I'm, uh, I'd like to end with this. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to, to our exchange. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Thank you all for this. So we can move now to uh, the exchange part of today's uh, webinar. So according to our agenda, uh, Elena, you can be the first to pose a uh, question and address questions to uh, ANR and WWTF. All right. Thank you. That was a, a short break. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Laurence. I, I'm, uh, I know ANR. We are collaborating with ANR. We know that the, the, the level or the dimension of your funding agency. and. Our question, uh, even if you touched it a bit in the presentation, would be how to really approach the evaluators to make them aware of this gender uh, dimension they need to look for in the proposals they evaluate. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Elena. Um, well, uh, I think the best way to prepare evaluators uh, is to organize dedicated trainings. And I, I heard that you, you were doing trainings also. And here, um, I, I think, and, and regarding to my experience, I think that those training must be based on scientific data. Because um, maybe it's linked to, to another question that uh, I was supposed to, to respond to. Uh, and um, it's, um, it's a good question because it's not so obvious indeed to get acceptance. Um, and the risk uh, is to be considered as an activist. And, 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 and regarding to my experience, if you want to convince scientists, you have to have a scientific discourse and scientific uh, arguments. Uh, uh, to 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 get um, uh, uh, acceptance. Um, so at the, the agency, we provide training um, on the one hand on each 
of the different stages uh, of the selection process and then on the other end on ethics integrity and professional conduct and gender is part of that uh, uh, second uh, type of trainings um, the objective is also to develop uh, other supports such as a guide or a MOOC uh, but we we still haven't had time to neither the resources to do that um, but trainings are very very important and it's um, uh, um, it gives us uh, the the opportunity also to exchange with the evaluators and uh, to to understand uh, much more uh, their uh, resistances if they are and um, it's um, uh, uh, quite a um, privilege to 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 have the opportunity to to train them yeah okay thank you very much shall i move to the next question Basia, thank you yes sure um, great thank you um donia this is uh, a question regarding your experience um we are working uh, also with the external environment as already um, said and uh, you are acting at regional level but you have also private um, funding so that might give you a bit of a more of a freedom in action i'm wondering what's your um, recommendation of a strong campaign even conducted at regional level to to help or to support the the gender dimension the advancement the mainstreaming whatever you would like to call it in science and technology from your experience thank you very much for the question so um as already i said at the beginning we are quite small also looking at numbers and looking at resources so maybe this is one of the hindering factors that we have when answering your question so we don't have actually a big marketing uh, budget, for example. So we don't have any, any possibility to do quite a big campaign in this regard. Uh, just uh, talking out of um, uh, history, we once tried to set up a campaign together with the research um, institutions here, with the RPOs, and together with the city of Vienna, as we have quite a strong link together with them, promoting science and excellence, not in the in the chat or in the gender field, but just you know promoting science, and it, and we uh, we we were not successful. So it was really everyone had their own goals, everyone wanted their own thing. Uh, we did a small campaign ourselves, but you know we there was no booster function. So this is just the one thing about campaigns. Um, Nevertheless, I think it's it's quite important uh, to foster it not by doing a very structured campaign, you know, like really having this big budget and doing these advertisements and everything, but by doing it on a more informal level and by doing it, having a lot, a lot of dialogue with all the players here. The um, advantage here is that you know you know your colleagues, you know the contacts, you know. You, you know the organizations who are there. You have quite a short way uh, working together with them, so there are no obstacles in working together. Um, so I think this is um, taking this into account. This gives us the flexibility to to operate. Um, and I mean, uh, what really helped us out was actually to have the EU project because to name it. The disadvantage of being a private organization, as you have pointed out, the private may be the advantage in this case. Well, actually, as sometimes it was not the advantage because we had no legal um, duties to fulfill. Looking at quarters, for example, there was no obligation to follow that. You know, it's still not that we do have to follow it. We can do it if we want. But uh, when looking, for example, at the national players who had the public laws and had to follow the public laws, they even had it easier in this respect. I wouldn't say it was really easier, you know, because there were there are large organizations. Maybe the processes are more cumbersome, but um, uh, this this is maybe this this juggling with this uh, having the small size but having the flexibility. Uh, what we actually did was um, an internal campaign, if you would name it like that. It was not; it was still not a campaign, but a very internal uh, discussion with employees and with our boards. Um, a continuous 
discussion, having examples uh, showing results of the GECO project. Also now what we're doing now is really taking the things that we did in the GECO project and putting it into a document. It's, it's nothing kind of new, but just bring it all together to have this chap in place. So, um, and I think what was said before is that facts and figures really help there. So having the evidence, having others who are front runners and uh, pointing at them and saying it's it's not it's not uh, you can do it you know it's not like fantasy or something like that so I think this is really important. All right, thank you very much for the comprehensive answer. I think you you covered the next question that's addressed to both of you. Uh, uh, I'm uh, we as a funding agency, we are interested on in how to better engage uh, the employees in this process our colleagues actually they they were part of the process but how to continue engaging them to keep them on board uh, in in this uh, process and i don't know ex examples from your uh, organization organization so it would be helpful thank you um shall i start yes um it's again it's a good question um, I would say that at INR, what uh, has really enabled us to make great progress is the commitment of our CEO, who publicly supports all of our actions internally and externally. Um, and the communication department is also responsible uh, for supporting these actions and to make them uh, visible. But um, uh, I, I, I I have to say that we have much worked with the top match management uh, and uh, I will start training for gender uh, next month with for, for all employees. But I noticed also that some actions um, have been more decisive uh, to uh, engage the internal stakeholders. Um, such as the production of an inclusive communication guide without gender uh, stereotypes that all employees must use and respect its principles. And uh, this guide constitutes, in fact, a constant reminder of the agency's commitment. And, and, and it also invites um, everyone to reflect on the place uh, given to women in all forms of communications. And it, this really helps, uh, I think, to raise awareness of inequalities. I could um, also mention other actions. Um, for example, each year, uh, the Human uh, Resources Department also launches uh, an internal survey um, on the quality of life at work. Uh, which includes a whole section on discrimination, sexism, and sexual harassment. So there are many um, small actions that are uh, uh, that constitutes constant reminder uh, of the commitment of the agency and the, imp the importance that uh, the, the, the top management and the CEO give to, to that topic. Maybe I just jump in there, um, just taking you on our, on my journey. Um, as I said before, we're 10 people. So, um, and we do a lot, a lot of things. So we, at the same time, we do the rules and regulations, but we also do the funding programs. We have the contact with our boards. We ourselves are a human resource department, the law department, the ed department, whatever, you know? So we are kind, uh, uh, we, we, we are kind of a very small universe. Um, so on the one hand, it's necessary that everyone is on board. Um, it's barely un, un, impossible if someone neglects uh, gender equality or gender in total. So this was the first kind of experience that we had. Um, I had the advantage of having uh, one colleague, um, she, she now left to another, to another organization, but she was actually one who incorporated all the changes into the first call. So she was the one together with me who was in the U project, who developed everything and then incorporated it immediately. 
Uh, and then actually the challenge was to also convince the others that they should incorporate it into their programs. And we had another colleague and she was totally against gender equality. She always said that it doesn't make any sense. Um, it doesn't play a role here because we kind of had this basic, I would, I would name it basic dilemma or fundamental research dilemma. People saying that if you do basic research, there is no gender in content um, um, uh, consideration there. You know, so this was the one thing that our project had that it don't have nothing to do with gender. There's it's it's about molecules and nothing else. So this was kind of I you know I exaggerate now, but this was kind of the position of my colleague and saying I have other things to do that are more important. It's for us, it's quality, it's excellence and scientific quality is the, the one criterion we're looking at. And actually we had one uh, very nice uh, example who had um, an external expert that we invited her to give a training for everyone. And then we discussed these kind of things and these kind of opinions. And it was very nice because we took our project uh, data bank and we looked together at the projects and thought about where could there be uh, a gendering content, you know, where is it relevant, uh, so really to get it very practical. And I am always um, taking this example of studies when you study mice, for example, yeah, we have like study object, it's not human, but still it's mice. And I'm always saying, okay, there are pink and blue mice, you know, it may be also be a different difference if you have the male or female mice, even at that stage. And we, we together, we kind of um, saw then that there are a lot, a lot of projects who could consider gender. Some of them that don't, you know, if it's like physics or really molecules or whatever, it, sometimes it really doesn't play a role. But this was something that at least we, we convinced the people that they should ask others, our applicants, to consider it, <laughs> even if it's not for all the projects. And I think... Um, this dialogue, this uh, not having to convince everyone 100%, but at least to have them on board is really important. It was, and what was really, really a success factor is having someone in the EU project dealing with all the gender considerations and then incorporating it. And now where we got new employees, it was very important to get them on board again and to tell them what we did and that they also have to incorporate it. And there are advantages. If you have people, I have one new colleague, she studied gender studies and this is, you know, I mean, uh, this is really good. So I don't have to explain anything there. Sorry for the long long uh, answer. Thank you very much. I guess uh, I guess there's a lot uh, to learn here. Thank you. Uh, Vasya, I think my slot is done. <laughs> yes, Elena, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so now it is Nadej, uh, uh, yes, order to yes. pose the questions. So thank you. We may start. Yeah, um, just to come back on the gender dimension in research. So I could not give any details about the content of our gender equality plan as uh, it is not validated yet. But uh, I was talking about uh, the update we had to do following the Bureau of the Board of Directors. And in fact, we had to uh, erase the part on the gender dimension in research content. It was not accepted uh, because it's supposed to be against the freedom of research. So my first questions would be, how did you manage? Uh, so first it was addressed to the ones, but I can see that Donia also uh, dealt with the same kind of issue. How did you manage in an INR to have a pilot project on gender dimension in research accepted? Uh, and uh, yeah, of course, uh, the question can be extended to Donia. Well, uh, again, good question. Uh, as I said, it was uh, not so obvious uh, uh, at the beginning uh, to, to get acceptance. And as I said before, uh, uh, in regarding to my experience as a, as a sociologist, uh, working on gender, uh, I know that we have to have uh, scientific arguments to, to, to get acceptance. And so, um, to me, sex and gender dimension in research content is part of research integrity and of social responsibility of science. 
the the objectives uh, of considering uh, the sex and, and gender dimension is to eliminate any gender bias in production of knowledge and to anticipate uh, the potential consequences of their applications and particularly on health, uh, social, economic, or environmental levels. Um, therefore, not considering the consequences is not responsible and not taking that dimension into account is not robust in terms of methodology. So the notion uh, of freedom, as you mentioned, uh, as an argument uh, to, to, to resist and to not accept, um, the notion of freedom in research does not mean that everything is permitted. Research practices are framed by a suit of rule, rules and, and values that must guarantee their harnessed and scientifically rigorous character. So to, to obtain the support of research actors on this specific topic, it is necessary to rely uh, on these rules that they all must respect. And this is the way uh, 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 I convinced, <laughs> I, I, I can say, uh, the, the top management and then all the evaluators uh, with whom I, I do some trainings and, um, and it seems to be working. Maybe just to, to give a, a short answer to your question, uh, I have to spoil the answer first, as spoiler alarm. Um, the first one was that the main argument actually was that others already did it. So the national funders already incorporated it. So we were not the first movers, which is uh, was easier for us then because we pointed to them, even to the national funder who is in basic research. And we said, OK, they're doing it already, you know, so it was not a big thing. And we also had a very fruitful context that also the RPOs already installed um, the competence in-house. So even there, they had like a gender expert, someone there who trained them or who gave them consultation, which uh, made it easier for us because there was already a support system in place. Um, just to, to, to be honest, I think what I mentioned before, the main, the main discussion is about the scientific excellence criterion. So what is scientific excellence? And um, as a research funder, or in, in our sphere at least, it's mainly this is the, the quality criteria and argument. So you have to have like the best scientific uh, um, research funded. And I'm um, actually starting this discussion and we did that. So we started, it's not ended. <laughs> so we started it, um, but we, we started it and, and, you know, talking about who defines this scientific quality and in, in what kind of structure is it embedded and everything like that. So I think this is maybe the key point uh, getting the whole thing going and also like uh, keeping the discussion going. But we had it easier, I have to confess. Well, you don't have to feel guilty about that. Huh? That's a good point. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, on uh, the FNOS site, the example of the neighbors uh, who already implemented it uh, did not work. It was not sufficient. But let's see the, uh, how it will go in, uh, in the future years. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my other question uh, was um, also about the um, dimension of the balance in the decision making structures. Uh, because here, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's quite difficult to change uh, to change things as there are a lot of constraints in, term, in terms of uh, legal framework. And so I was uh, wondering uh, for, especially maybe for INR, uh, was there already an imbalance in the decision making uh, structure? And if yes, uh, what corrective uh, measures did you uh, did you suggest, uh, and how did you deal with potential resistance? 
because here it's quite complicated because there are lots of uh, functions inside the board of directors that are already uh, uh, indicated, like, for example, all the rectors uh, needs to be in the board of directors, the rectors of the six universities, and most of them are men, of course, and we don't have any influence on them because they are nominated in their own universities. And uh, yeah, we, we don't have a lot of uh, matter of maneuver, unfortunately. Yeah, I understand. We have the same problem uh, with the administrators board that are designed by, by the decree. So uh, the, the, the head of the uh, research organizations have to uh, be member of the uh, administrators board and, 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 and we cannot do anything about that. So, uh, but um, re regarding the situation uh, at the agency, internally at the agency, uh, we have um, a specific uh, situation in that 62% of the employees are women. And that in the history of the agency, which is a uh, very young uh, agency, 16 years old only, uh, two of the four CEOs uh, who succeeded each other were women. So two men and two women at the, the head of the, the agency. So, and as regards top management, parity is systematically uh, sought, uh, but where we have um, a difficulty is uh, on the salaries uh, of the top management. As we are a small structure, uh, it is very difficult to have access uh, to it because it would be so too too easy to identify people. So, uh, but the 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 head of human resources um, told us that there were indeed differences uh, between women and men salaries. So, but I I don't know uh, how to manage uh, that part. So, if you have any idea. <laughs> Would you also like me to give a short, short answer from our side? Yeah, sure. Um, so this was actually one of the main problems that we had. Um, I told you about the Chico project. We were looking in Chico mostly on the external side. So on our jury composition, our reviewers, and uh, there we can easily change things. And we had a parity normally, so it was quite we were good there in the numbers and still are, and this is what we continue to do, um, even including someone with uh, gender expertise uh, additionally into the jury. So this was an add-on. Uh, but the main problem was internally and still is. And this is why I actually it was also for me personally important to have this chap in place to change or to start changing something internally. Um, I told you we have a board of directors, which is six people. Um, fortunately, one person there now is female. Uh, we have an advisory board with 26 people and out of them, seven are female. And now you can <laughs> calculate <laughs> that this is not re really um, uh, equal. And on the other hand, if you look at our organization, so the people who are working here, uh, we were 10 people and seven out of them are female. So it's just the other way around. And this is actually something that, that I don't, think is really something that should stick like that. Now, we also are bound to that because uh, we have our statutes and there it's written in who can send the board members. So there are organizations who can send people. and uh, We cannot interfere in that. Uh, but I had an idea, and this is also something that we will discuss now. It's not set in stone or anything, but to, to change that and to say that, for example, if an organization can send two people, that at least have to be parity between uh, one female and one male um, to, to gradually get change into the system and to change these numbers, which seem to be like stick in stone and you cannot change them. But um, I have now kind of the understanding also from management that this may, might be a way to change something. Um, yeah, but it's, it's not something that, that's happening from one day to another. So this is something that has to take time over 
of the years to come. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, in our case, for example, in the FNRS Board of Directors, um, for the free comprehensive universities, uh, they, they need to have uh, the rector, of course, but also uh, uh, another person, but they all chose to, to nominate the vice rector for research. And of course it makes sense because, uh, because I think they are the most uh, uh, interested by what happened in the board of directors. But of course it means that uh, in general, it, it, we, we cannot say it has to be one male, one female, you, you see. Uh, okay, thanks a lot about uh, your answer about this subject. And uh, my last question was more about our near future uh, regarding the implementation of the plan. Uh, how do you monitor this implementation? Uh, is there, for example, a midterm uh, update process uh, in case some objectives are not reached uh, as expected, uh, can you update the plan or should you wait until the end of the multi-annual plan to do that? Uh, do you have um, concretely uh, more uh, concrete annual action plans uh, besides the multi-annual public uh, gender equality plan? How, how does it work in, uh, in your organizations? Well, we have uh, set up an action plan steering committee that meets uh, monthly. The members are essential uh, resources for the implementation of the JEP. Uh, we have uh, with us um, the head of the human resources department, the head of the communication department. Uh, we have one of the staff representative and, uh, and, and we thought it was very important to have them with us because um, they may be uh, quite uh, few resistances from the staff re representatives. So it was very important to, to, to get them involved. Um, we also have with us the head of the scientific uh, department and the prevention uh, manager. And uh, we also developed monitoring sheets for each uh, of the actions included in the plan. And um, what can I say today? 65% uh, uh, of our actions have been completed. Uh, the, this good score uh, can also be explained by the fact that the JEP was for us an opportunity to formalize what we were already doing uh, before uh, uh, elaborating this, uh, this JEP. Uh, so there are actions that we had to register to, to, to be consist consistent with the national uh, context and uh, national law about that. Uh, so those actions were in fact already in place when we uh, wrote uh, the, the JEP. So the context, the French context, context is quite uh, 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 favorable because uh, we each uh, uh, research organizations and public uh, institution had to elaborate and implement a, a gender equality plan. And if not, uh, we had to, to give a, 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 a copy uh, in December uh, two, 2021, yes. And uh, if we did not, uh, if we were not able to, to give the copy back, uh, we had the financial sanction. So, um, uh, so the, the context is pretty good in France. Sorry, uh, Laurence, your, um, this obligation was for which organization? All public institutions. Okay. So yes. all the universities and... Universities and research organizations and, and funding organizations. Okay. 
And yeah, unfortunately, we didn't have that favorable environment <laughs> <laughs> and the punishment and sanctions. But uh, we took the momentum from the EU um, kind of um, uh, that you had to have a jab. So we just took it and I said, okay, it's relevant. If we want to be partner in another EU project, we should have that. And um, actually, this argument paid off. <laughs> so until now, um, we definitely have a monitoring system. So the goal is in the next round to have the actions in place. Actually, we did a lot of work already. So we kind of have a list already of actions. We just have to to talk with our advisory board and if you want to change something. But there's a list of actions we have. Um, six main goals we want to reach in the three areas that I showed you before, always internally and externally, and actions that kind of um, um, makes it uh, possible for us to achieve these goals. And some of them we already have fulfilled in the GIGO projects, others they're still ongoing, but we will have an annual kind of look at this, um, uh, at the action plan. And we will also install an annual kind of monitoring and reporting in our boards, which is quite, I think, uh, important if you look at the culture aspect. So how to get it into, into the organization that there is a constant dialogue about it. And this we will have, and hopefully we'll have every, everything in place in June. So if everything works out well, we will have the whole documentation and also the set of measures and, and actions and um, next year that will be the first monitoring. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, time for me to leave the floor too. Thanks. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Nadez, and everyone as well. Um, because of the timing issues, we were wondering uh, if uh, actually the chat box uh, questions have been addressed. And uh, as I've seen from the chat box, uh, the question, the one question that was posed has already been addressed. So, um, Maria, would you like to say uh, a few final words as uh, a coordinator? Yes, I. Uh, I mean, I really not not. I I would like very much to to say if these uh, seven minutes maybe someone else would like to say something else <laughs> before we uh, we uh, close. I think it's it's really interesting uh, how you can see this mutual uh, exchange uh, uh, between the four speakers and I and, and experiences that I think it's uh, really good. I have. I, I myself have many questions to <laughs> uh, to have, but I don't know if uh, we have time or you would like to uh, to already um, close this, the webinar. Yes, I think there is unfortunately no proper time. Uh, uh, time, so yeah. Yes, we, we hope to had more actually, but the discussion was very lively, and mm -hmm. I would like to thank you all for your very valuable input and that you presented your pitfalls and your strengths and um, the fact that uh, you you know each other somehow and uh, what you are doing and that you identified also uh, a few points and strengths and weaknesses uh, today with us was really interesting and we hope that it was interesting also for uh, for the audience uh, that was here with us we were a considerable small uh, group and um, we hope that it was also useful for you as uh, speakers and for your journey and your organizations. Uh, so uh, we would really like to have your input. So if you can take a couple of minutes to complete an exit questionnaire that was posted in the chat group, it would be great. And uh, with that, we would like to wish you a very nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you.